Good morning, Grace Fellowship. My name is Sam Whitehawk. I am one of the pastors here in Saskatoon, and it's a privilege of mine. I get to preach God's word to you this morning. So if you have your Bibles, please open them to John chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. If you need a Bible, there's a few on the table there. We're actually well stocked. If you don't own one, please keep it for yourself. It's a gift to you. We want you to read God's word for yourself. So as you turn to John 15, I've got a couple questions for you. What if someone told you that the greatest experience known to man has been found? That the greatest satisfaction, the most pleasing life ever is available? What if they said the greatest pleasure, greater than sex or money or any opportunity this world has to offer, is available free of charge? So would you pay attention? As natural skeptics, I I think, wouldn't we at least try and see what the catch is? Because nothing's ever for free, right? Wouldn't you at least hear out the offer? And what if I told you that the one making the offer is the creator of all things, including the entire human experience? The one who made humans. So he has insider information as to why humans were created. And what could possibly bring them the greatest joy? He has the owner's manual because he is the owner. And so you'll never guess what happens next in my passage. (laughs) Jesus is the greatest joy that we could ever know. And today we're going to hear how Jesus, the one who created heaven and earth, knows exactly why we were created. And that is for a relationship with him. John 15 says that we were made to abide in him, bearing fruit for our full joy and for his glory. And I hope that by the time we're done, we know what all of that means. So John 15 verse 11 says this, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So let's listen to our scripture scripture passage for today. Reading from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Last week, as Murray preached, he told us about how the Holy Spirit, who is God, dwells inside of those who believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the reason we can put our faith and hope in Christ. And John 14, verse 26, it says that the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So in this verse, we get a picture of how our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all at work in helping us see the beauty of Jesus in the scriptures. So my hope is that whatever cares or burdens you came in with today, and however tired you may be feeling, that you would uh, just see how being in Jesus, abiding in Jesus' love, puts everything else in perspective. That we get to abide in Jesus. 
So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would speak to us through the scripture passage today. Uh, Father, I just pray that you would open our eyes to see what you have for us in this word. And I just pray that we would all walk away here wanting to abide in you. Thank you so much for your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so John 15, verses 1 and 2. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So Jesus Christ, the true vine, he comes in perfect obedience to his Father. This is our last I am statement in, in the book of John. And, and those are metaphors where Jesus used you know, everyday language to communicate to them that he was divine, that Jesus is God. And so here he says, I am the true vine. And of the seven statements, this is the first one that includes the Father in this. So Jesus isn't the true vine apart from the Father's work. He is the true vine because of the Father. Jesus has been saying throughout the whole book of John that I and the Father are one. There's no separation between the two persons in the Trinity. They are God. Jesus is one with the Father. So Jesus is the true vine that would never fail, whereas in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel would be referred to as the vine who had failed, who had sinned. But Jesus comes in perfect obedience to the Father. So the Father's role in our passage is not passive with this vine. The vine is Jesus Christ. And in verse 2, we see that people are the branches. He says that later on too in verse 4. But there is a sharp contrast between the branches that are uh, abiding in Jesus and bearing fruit and those who are just in Jesus, not bearing fruit fruit. So as I was thinking about this passage over the last few weeks and meditating on it, I just kept uh, trying to understand this language of the vine and the vine dresser and the branches and the fruit. And I don't necessarily think that way. So I'm I'm an electrician by trade. And so when I kept hearing vine dresser, I kept thinking uh, Johnny Depp and Edward Scissorhands and just this weird language with someone on his scissors on his hands and it just doesn't, doesn't work for me necessarily. So I had to think in my language. So as an electrician, and I hope it gets on the, uh, the screen for you, I want to show you an electrical panel. So my background, this is what you would see in a house. Raise your hand if you know where in your house the electrical panel is. How many know? Okay, most hands went up. I'm very happy. I'm very happy. How many of you think you're electricians and tried to do something and got shocked? How many... <laughs> That's, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Call an electrician. But anyway, that's, that's, that aside, an electrical panel in your house is the source of all power and all ele- electricity in your house. That is where the power starts. And so as I was thinking about this, I was thinking Jesus is like an electrical panel in your house. And the father is like the electri- electrician who maintains the panel And those wires, you see all those wires going into the panel, those are what connects from the panel, the source of power itself, right to whatever electrical device you plug in, to your switch, to your uh, plug, to your light, whatever it is, this is where it all comes from. So in our language here, people are the breakers. So what a breaker does, and it has many functions, I'll try and distill it down, but a breaker safely allows the flow of electricity from the panel to the house, the rest of the house. So a breaker's simple job is to allow power to flow through it in a safe way. So here, if you have a breaker and you see a breaker on the ground, you should know there is no power attached to that breaker. And there is nothing that is being powered by it. It's just a breaker. It has a simple job. However, what really can baffle electricians is when you have circuits and plugs that are turned off and you go to your panel and you see that everything is turned on. Well, what is it? How can a breaker be in a panel and yet not be passing power through it? 
And so I started to think about this a little more. The Holy Spirit could be the power, but I don't, I don't want to give up too much because I might write a book about it in 30 years. But, um, but because this is our language in our passage, we're going to go back to the vine and the vine dresser. So John 15, verse 2, says this, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, so the Father, the vine dresser, takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So the Father's role is either to remove the branches who are not bearing fruit and also to prune the ones who are bearing fruit to produce even more. And what John will further reinforce in our passage is that every branch that abides in Jesus bears fruit. So it is a contradiction to abide in Jesus and not bear fruit. That's why in John 2, it says the Father takes it away. If it's not bearing fruit, it's not abiding in Jesus. Later on in verse 6, Jesus says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered thrown into the fire, and burned. So once again, Jesus is using everyday common language that people would be familiar with and just explains how this actually impacts judgment. The Father is at work here, and the Father is active, and the Father cares for the vine. So before we get to the rest of our passage, I want to highlight what the Father is doing here. It is only the Father who knows the true branches that are connected to the vine. Verse 2, he says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So it's just like for, for a customer, and I've seen it before at work, they're, you're getting called and all my breakers are on, why aren't my plugs working? And it's the electrician that can come and diagnose to see not every breaker is working, even though it is in the panel. So what a good electrician will do is take that breaker out and put a breaker in that will allow power to go. Like the father is at work in this vine, removing branches who are not bearing any fruit. I want to highlight that, no fruit. And then he prunes the ones that are bearing fruit so that more fruit may abound. So I want to make sure we see this. There are people who appear to be in Jesus who are not producing fruit. It's not that they're producing a little. They are not producing fruit. And only time or judgment will expose their hearts as never truly being connected to the vine himself, Jesus Christ. I want to turn to Matthew chapter 7. And this is Jesus speaking. Jesus says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. So this is language. The people speaking to Jesus know who he is. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Those are the ones who enter. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? and do many mighty works in your name? This is Jesus here. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, workers of lawlessness. These are chilling verses from the Lord himself. I never knew you. Or what we'll see from our passage, you never abided in me. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13.5, he says this, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Every once in a while, it's helpful for us to examine ourselves, as the Apostle Paul reminds us. See whether you are in the faith. Because here's our example from the book of John. It's been leading to this, and it's so clear. Consider Judas, one of the 12 disciples who betrayed him. 
Like any murder mystery film, no one would have suspected it was Judas. They didn't think it was him. Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And they're saying, is it me, Lord? Is it me? No one just points to Jesus and says, yeah, clearly, or to Judas. Judas is a guy. You know, we know he's not really with us. Because he looked and acted and sounded like, and maybe he even thought he was just like every other one of the disciples. But the reason why we, the readers, know that Judas would betray him is because we can look back. Judas was able to check off every box that would make him appear to be a disciple, that would make us think that he was in Christ. Did he follow Jesus? Check. Did he attend a weekly worship service? Check. I'm just making a point there. I think every day with Jesus is a worship service. But, uh, did he read his Bible and know his Bible? Check. Did he do many mighty works in Jesus' name? Check. But in the end, the father took away Judas because he did not bear fruit. And what that means is that he did not love Jesus or abide in Jesus' love. And so as a pastor, this is something that that bothers me to, to my core and has caused me to spend a lot of time in prayer because there are most likely, and scripture talks about this a lot, some in our fellowship, who may think they are following Jesus, but they are not because they don't love Jesus. And only time or, or even only judgment will reveal this to be true. That somehow by thinking, attending a Christian events or by doing Christian activities somehow makes you a true follower of Christ. But Judas is a great example that all of us can be 10 feet away from Jesus and still not love him in our hearts. But the Father can discern where human eyes can fail. And that's why he's the vine dresser. It's not up to you and I to make pronouncements. It's up to us to abide in Jesus Christ. And the distinguishing factor doesn't matter what branch you are or think you are. You both need the same thing. You need the gospel. You need to abide in Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing. If you examine yourself, which Paul tells us to do, but if you don't have the correct answer sheet, you're going to end up marking everything wrong. And so it is with the Christian faith. If you don't examine yourself and all you come back to is whether or not you are doing Christian works, or attending Christian events while neglecting the gospel, you're missing the point. If you don't go to the gospel, then you're missing the point. You're just coming back to Christian works and Christian activities, and we saw that it's possible for someone to do those things and yet see Jesus on Judgment Day and to have him say, I never knew you. So the hope for all of us It's not fear or panic, but it's the gospel. We must return to the gospel and we must return to Jesus Christ because here's the truth of the gospel. Jesus was the branch that was treated as though he bore no fruit. Jesus is the branch that was cut off, taken away, and burned under the just and perfect righteous wrath of God. Jesus was treated as though there, were, well, there was no abiding fruit in him so that you could now have hope and faith in Jesus, so that you can now abide in his love, and so that you could be connected to the vine himself, producing the fruit that flows from a love for Jesus and a love for his people and a love for the lost. This is what it means to abide in Jesus. So the true branch has Jesus and is truly in him. The true branch abides in him. And this is what our passage is about, abiding in the love of Jesus Christ. So before we start, let's take a look at the word abide. It means to remain or to stay. It's it's just an intense language that to be in Jesus Christ and to stay in Jesus Christ to abide in Jesus. Verse 4 says, Abide in me and I in you. And in verse 9 says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Remain in my love. 
To remain in Jesus or to abide, it actually means that Jesus must be our starting place. He says in verse 3, already you are clean. Remember, he's talking to the remaining 11 now. He says, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. It's only because of Jesus that we are clean. We don't clean ourselves up and come to him to abide. He cleans us by his words and by his works. Then we abide and remain in Jesus. And we have to get that order correct or else we're going to foolishly think, and I've been there before, that somehow my obedience and my works is what cleans me up and then I could be accepted and abide in Jesus. But he says, he starts here, verse three, already you are clean because of the words that I've spoken to you. Jesus cleans us up, and his call to us is not to clean ourselves up, but to remain, to abide in him. So Jesus reminds us that he is the vine. Life can only be found in him. The gospel teaches that because Jesus obeyed the Father perfectly, we get to abide in Christ. Because of Jesus... He went to the cross and he died in our place and he rose again so we are able to abide in Jesus. We abide because he first abides in us and gives us the life that flows through us, bearing fruit. We love because he first loved us. So, fun fact. In our passage today, the word abide actually appears 10 times. And so as Bible teachers, we're, we're trained to spot and notice repetition. So I was able to, you know, figure this out. Okay, one abide, two abide, ten abide, ah, ah, ah. Right? So the, the message today is brought to you by the letter A and the number 10. So abide is, is the, uh, the resounding message here. So let's look at verse 4. It says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself... Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So the branches, followers of Jesus, our only hope of life, of spiritual life and vitality is to remain in the vine. This is the only way to live. We are reminded that a Christian life is a spirit-filled life throughout the book of John. And the spirit lives in us to see the glory of Christ in the scriptures and to want to obey Jesus, to want to abide in him. It is spiritual life. However, sometimes, and I don't know if it's just, if it's, um, men that are guilty of this or or church planters or whatever, but we can somehow think that we can live the Christian life apart from Jesus, that somehow we can take the commands of Christ, try to obey each one and and just say, here, God, here's some fruit. But it's not what Jesus says. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. He's not talking about tying his shoes. He's talking about spiritual life, fruit of eternal value. Anything that is good that flows from the Father, that flows from a heart that abides in him, apart from him, we can do nothing. And so I hope this is a great reminder for any student or a great word of encouragement for any parent and some profound wisdom for any spouse or refreshing news for any leader. Apart from Jesus You can do nothing. And I truly believe Jesus has to remind us of the absurdity of trying to do something for God instead of simply abiding in him. He is the vine, we are the branches. He has to remind us of that. It's just like a branch thinking, I'm going to bear fruit apart from myself on the ground. Never going to happen. Apart from me, You can do nothing. But it's his life and nourishment that produces fruit in us. So in verse 7, Jesus says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, 
and it will be done for you. By this, the Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So abiding in Jesus includes having a prayer life. And this is why when we talk about our discipleship rhythms, about loving Jesus, we start with prayerful meditations on the scriptures. That's communicating with God and listening to his communication to us. It's essential. Jesus says it right here. That my words, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. And this glorifies the Father, and it also shows that we are his disciples. So distilled to a simpler form, prayer is conversation in relationship with Jesus. It is a dialogue with the living God. He hears us and answers us. This is why we recommend praying with an open Bible, because he speaks to us clearly in his word. The Holy Spirit opens our minds and our ears to hear what God has to say. We speak to him in prayer, and this glorifies the Lord. The more we abide in him, the more we can pray his will be done. It comes from relationship. Whatever we wish, it says here, comes after abiding in him. Just in case you you may have thought that Jesus was like genie from Aladdin, right? We just wish whatever we want. But really, it comes from abiding in him so that our prayers and whatever we ask is in his name. It's for his will to be done. Abiding in the Lord and having scriptures dwell in us gives us the greater ability to know the will of God and to pray for others. Jesus bears fruit through us. And he uses prayer and scripture for that. D.A. Carson, he's a New Testament scholar. He's written a book on the Gospel of John, and he says this, In short, Christians must remember that the fruit that issues out of their obedient faith union with Christ lies at the heart of how Jesus brings glory to his Father. Those who are contemplating the claims of the Gospel, like John's readers, must reckon with the fact that failure to honor the Son is failure to honor God. Fruitlessness not only threatens fire, but robs God of the glory that's rightly his. He is zealous for the fruit that he produces in and through you. He, the vine dresser, cares so much for the vine. He is active and he is at work. And when we are praying and when we are abiding in him and allowing the scriptures to abide in us, we are bringing glory to God. So verse 9 says this, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. The love of Jesus is not conditional on our works. As I said, you don't have to clean yourself up. If you're not a believer and you're here and you're considering who Jesus is, don't believe the lie that somehow you got to earn your way to Jesus Christ. You just come to him as you are. And here's what he says. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. And he says abide in his love. He can do so knowing that his work on the cross is finished and that the very means by which we can remain in him is Jesus. And this fact is crucial because we got to remember Jesus tells us to abide in him. Because only in Jesus can one be loved by him. And only in Jesus can one bear fruit. And only in Jesus can one glorify God. But he never once tells us to earn it. Never says, clean yourself up and try again later. So consider this for a second. Jesus says that he loves us as the Father loves him. That is a perfect love, an eternal love that was from eternity past. This amazing love that the Father has for Jesus is the same love that Jesus has for his people. So if you're a believer in Christ, Jesus loves you with a perfect love that surpasses any human understanding. And it's hard to fathom 
but Jesus loves you better than any human ever has or ever will. Jesus' love for you is so perfect and it's amazing because he knows you inside and out. He knows your mistakes. He knows your past. He knows your future. He knows your sins. And yet, in Jesus, he loves you with a perfect love. That's amazing. That is good news. So I hope that you remember this as you continue to bear the burdens of your day and of your week and of your year. Remember the all-satisfying love for you in Jesus Christ that God has for you. And this love, in love, he calls us to rest and to abide and to remain in the love that Jesus has for us. And it's the sweet medicine for the aching soul. So abiding also includes obedience. Verse 10 says this, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So here, Jesus says that fruit flows from obedience, which flows from Jesus Christ, from abiding in him. Obedience isn't uh, in and of itself producing the fruit. Remember that Jesus says it's impossible apart from him to do anything. That includes producing fruit. So obedience comes from abiding in Jesus Christ and having him produce fruit through you. That is how we obey God. And that is how we honor him. Because here's the thing. If you think as the branch that your obedience is producing fruit, you're missing the gospel. And if by your obedience, you're thinking that as a branch, that's why you're connected to the vine and like all those other people, you're missing the gospel. But as we said, Jesus was cut off so that you could be grafted in. And as the branch, we obey from abiding in Jesus and God produces fruit in and through us. So he does that for his glory. And that's why abiding in him, which leads to obedience, is what proves that we are his disciples. And finally, we say a grace fellowship Our mission is to love Jesus, love people, and help people love Jesus. In verse 12, we're going to read later on, Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And in verse 16, he says this, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Imagine that we share the gospel with people and they in turn believe in Jesus Christ and they start abiding in him and telling others about him. This is the fruit that abides and this is the mission he has called us to. So I hope that you see abiding in and loving Jesus is a privilege. We get to love the Father and we get to love the Son and we get to love the Holy Spirit. We are commanded over and over again to abide in his love. Obeying Jesus includes many things. But Jesus says first and foremost that the greatest commandment is to love God with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our strength. This is abiding in his love. We love because he first loved us. We get to love because he loved us. So it's no surprise that as our next few messages in John will continue to remind us of what it means to abide in Jesus' love and what it means to bear fruit as we continue on in mission to the world. Because as followers of Jesus, we show we are his disciples by obeying him, by loving Jesus, by loving people, and by taking this gospel forward. So I mentioned to you from the very beginning of this message that abiding in Jesus Christ is the fullest joy we could experience. It's, it's fullness of joy that Jesus says. That's why he told us these things. That Jesus, the creator of heaven and earth, the maker of all humans, tells us that abiding in Jesus is our fullest joy. 
And so because of the gospel, we can now remain or abide in God's love because he died on the cross for our sins and he rose again from the grave. And because of this, we as branches who believe in Jesus Christ can be connected to the vine. We can bear fruit for God's glory and we can continue to love Jesus. This is a result of the gospel.